The following slides are the end of Chapter 18 notes for students who are absent on Thursday and Friday. Um, please do not forget to have a quiz on Monday. So the quiz on Monday will be on Chapter 18. And so looking through the slides, this should have been the last slide that we have discussed, which was the Boreal Forest. Um, so hopefully you have this, this information written down. And moving on, so we're, we're moving away from trees and forests and we're moving to rangelands and agricultural lands. So these are also part of um, the lands that are found in the United States and um, they are also privately and um, publicly owned. And so you need to know what a rangeland is. Here's your definition from your textbook. It's land that is not intensively managed and is used for grazing livestock. Um, and so you should know in general rangelands um, tend to be our tropical um, and temperate grasslands. So if you think back to our biomes chapter, we talked about grasslands. Um, and you should think about the uh, special features of grass, grasslands. We talked about um, some periodic fires of grasslands. So just think about those areas that are mainly found in the Midwestern part of the United States. Um, rangelands are overseen by two agencies under the federal government. So the BLM, um, or the Bureau of Land Management, as well as the United States Forest Service. And these lands are considered renewable as long as they're used sustainably, just like our trees and just like our fresh water. Um, they are mainly used for grazing cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, but other than just grazing livestock, they can also be used for mineral exploration, energy resources. Um, we can use them for recreation. They can also provide a habitat for animals. And if you look at the right-hand side of this picture here, most of our grasses in our rangelands are going to have something called a fibrous root. A fibrous root um, helps to anchor the grass down into the ground so that as the animals are stomping on the ground and grazing the land, that the roots are, are held down into the soil. So even if the top of the plant ends up dying or it's eaten away, that root system is able to stay anchored down and so it's able to regrow and it also helps to prevent erosion. Um, sometimes students ask the difference between a rangeland and a pasture land. And just to differentiate that for you, rangelands are lands with native grasses as pasture lands are lands that um, are usually uh, uh, basically planted by humans. So they're established by humans. Um, and as I mentioned before, fires are a part of this biome and they're actually very helpful, helpful for this biome. So um, fires, whether they're natural or intentional, they basically are going to burn off the mature grass and kind of just like if you think of subsistence um, farming and slash and burn, it's going to take the nutrients from the plant and put it up into the air and then those nutrients are going to fall back and help to regenerate the grass. So fires can be helpful for our rangelands. So some rangeland, tr rangeland trends in the United States. Um, so rangelands, as I said, is um, comprised 30%, makes up 30% of our land in the United States, a third public and two-thirds private. So um, if you think back to our forest land, we have the same issues with our rangelands in that it concerns us when two-thirds of the land is privately owned because people who own the rangelands um, they're under economic pressure to basically develop these lands and to instead put uh, homes and condominiums um, because they're going to make money from it. And so um, these percentages here kind of um, concern environmentalists. A lot of times they want to be subdivided into homes, like I said, condos. But um, just like our, our forests, rangelands also um, can be saved, so our private rangelands, by conservation groups. And they also will provide funding and money for conservation easements. So if you think back to when we talk, talked about the Forest Legacy Program, it's a very similar idea in that conservation groups, they raise money, and then they are able to um, pay a private owner um, a certain amount to not develop their rangeland, to keep it as a rangeland. So it's, it's there to help save some of our rangelands across the United States. 
some of the issues involving our public rangelands, so we're talking about that one third um, that you can see. First of all, on our public rangelands, if you are a local rancher, you are able to pay a fee and graze your animals onto the rangeland. And so something that can possibly happen is overgrazing. And so that basically just means that the animals are going to um, eat up all the vegetation, their hooves are going to cause all of the plants to die. And this usually happens when we have too many animals grazing on the land. So it's animals exceed the carrying capacity. So we have a carrying capacity for a certain area of land. It can hold a certain number of, of grazing animals. And then beyond that, it's exceeded the carrying capacity and it, and it basically makes the land um, unusable. And so the next bullet point here, when we have overgrazing coupled with drought, that can cause something called desertification, which we've talked about before. So desertification is when we have um, one's productive farmland, so we're able to use it, and it becomes unproductive and desert-like. So both of these, overgrazing and drought, can cause desertification. And desertification is something that's poorly understood by scientists, but it's something that we're seeing happen when the carrying capacity is exceeded of our rangeland. Another issue, at least in the United States, with our public rangelands, as I said, um, a private owner, a private livestock owner, he is able to pay a fee and use the public rangelands to graze his animals. And the concern with this for environmentalists is that it's significantly cheaper to graze animals on public land versus private land. So um, I think your book gives you a roundabout estimate from 2006. It costs about $13 to, per cow to graze animals on privately owned land. So you're thinking about that you're paying taxes on that land, you bought that land, you're maintaining that land. So $13 per cow. Whereas on a public um, rangeland, it's significantly cheaper. So it's only just under $2, like $1.73 per cow. And so a lot of environmentalists feel as though people are not charged enough to graze their animals on the public um, land. And um, another issue with this is that um, the only people who are allowed to um, get these permits are local ranchers. So if we have an environmentalist or a group of people who would like to, to get a permit for an area of public land, basically to save that land from being overgrazed, they're unable to buy that permit. So, so that's kind of a concern for environmentalists. Um, like I said, it's so cheap for them to graze their animals on it. And the rest of the money that goes towards maintaining these public um, lands really comes from our tax dollars. So um, they feel as though they should have the right to be able to also purchase these, these uh, permits in order to just save the land. And here are some of our rangelands in the United States. So you can see, really, they're, they're grass prairies here in the United States and mostly in the western part of the United States. Moving on to agricultural lands. Um, in the United States, it says here that we have about 300 million acres of prime farmland. So prime farmland means that that land has a correct soil type, growing conditions, water availability, forage, fiber, soil nutrients. Um, basically, it is perfect for growing our crops. And um, as you can guess, especially looking at this picture right here, um, some of the problems that are facing some of these large areas of land, basically growing a population and urbanization. If you look at my bottom right hand picture here, you see a picture of the Corn Belt. Um, and 90% of the Corn Belt is actually prime farmland. So um, we use most of that land to grow corn. But a lot of the land that we have here let's see, um, is being taken over by suburban sprawl. So um, we've talked about this in the past. Um, we have growing population, so we're going to need more parking lots, housing development, shopping malls. And like I said, in this picture, you can see this uh, prime farmland here in the, in the left side of the picture. And then you can see 
this area in the middle here and the right that it's starting to sprawl outward. So people are, are sprawling outward from city centers here. Um, and you know that this is a trend that's happening um, even faster in developing countries. Uh, moving on to wetlands. Wetlands, as you can see the definition here, are lands that are covered with water for at least part of the year. Um, you're probably familiar with wetlands, as we should be living in Florida, so you should think of the Everglades. Um, they're really just transitional zones between water and land. And our inland wetlands, we used to think of mostly for like waterfowl and birds. Um, that's kind of what we thought that they were important for, but as scientists have researched these wetlands and um, have really studied them, we've realized that they provide us with an enormous number of ecosystem services. And I'm sure that you can name some ecosystem services. Um, in these pictures here, we have some water tolerant vegetation. So something that we're familiar with here, you can see these cattails, um, sawgrass is another example. So if you ever go out into the Everglades, um, you know that there are, are these very tall grasses that are water tolerant and they're able to survive um, in a mixture of, of water and also land. And like I just said, ecosystem services are a huge part of our wetlands, and we've discussed this before. Um, you should be able in your head to right now list a bunch of ecosystem services associated with wetlands. Um, I have a little cartoon here. It's talking about some of the ecosystem services. So today we'll see how wetland forests can act as a buffer against big storms and floods. Um, and in addition to that, they help purify the air and can help against global warming, provide fresh water for life, and much more. And any questions, me, couldn't we declare them the eighth wonder of the world? So basically, they're very, very important um, areas in the United States and around the world, and they provide us with so many ecosystem services. So hopefully you can think of a few off the top of your head. Um, you can see some listed here. If I was writing a free response question, the first thing I would think of is a habitat for animals. Um, we have a wide range of animals, depending on if it's uh, a coastal wetland or it could also be an inland wetland. Um, we know coastal wetlands, they help to buffer against storms. So we said like the mangroves, um, and we talked about that multiple times, where if you have a storm coming on shore, um, those trees and those mangroves will help to buffer the wind or help to reduce the speed of the wind as the storm comes on shore. Um, they also are there to help recharge our groundwater. Um, so if you have an area of, of that's a wetland, um, it can hold a lot of water, so it can help to prevent flooding. And then also that water will slowly sleep, uh, seep down into the ground, and it will fill up our aquifers. So we talked about uh, aquifer depletion, um, so that's definitely a helpful thing there. Um, they provide recreation, so think about the Everglades, think about Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge. You can go out there, you can go kayaking, you can go fishing, um, a wide range of things that you're able to do. And also we can get some food from there. And then you've seen this picture I think three or four times by this point. Um, you can see that they helps, it helps to purify the water. So as we have water that comes into a wetland, here's our little inland wet, wetland. Um, the water comes in, maybe it's polluted. Um, a lot of the pollution can settle down into the ground and is stored down in the ground. We have bacteria in here that are breaking down organic waste. So we also, if you remember th and think back, we talked about wetlands when we talked about um, um, sewage treatment. And we said that this is something that can be used in addition to sewage treatment plants that can help to reduce the amount of of pollutants in water from sewage. So if we have a wetland here, it can help the uh, organisms can help to break down the organic matter, like it could be fecal matter. Um, if we have uh, fertilizers that are running off from farmland, nitrogen and phosphorus, um, those also can be broken down and stored in the wetlands. Um, and as the water leaves a wetland, it is much cleaner than the water that enters a wetland. So these are just some of the ecosystem services provided by our wet wetlands. And um, as you could probably, if you were thinking about areas that have seen the biggest reduction in wetlands in the United States, so basically they've been filled or, or changed into something else, um, I, I think you could guess these. Florida tops the list, so Florida, Louisiana, and Texas, these three states, we've seen the biggest reduction in our wetlands. And, and the reason why is because we're basically filling them in many times for farmland. So if you think about the Everglades, um, we have a lot of farmland there. 
Um, and you can also attribute some of that to urbanization. So a lot of the areas where we're, we're living down in South Florida, those should be part of the Everglades and, and it, that should be a flooded grassland there, but instead we've built. So some of the threats here, um, drainage for agriculture, mosquito control, like I said, if you just think about the Everglades, um, a lot of the, the wetlands have been filled in so that we can grow sugar cane or oranges, whatever it may be, um, and also to help mosquitoes. So we know that mosquitoes like to breed um, in warm areas that have like flooded water. Um, and so if we, uh, we don't want mosquitoes, we would think to remove that, that water. Um, dredging for navigation, so we want to have access for boats to get through areas. Um, construction of dams, dikes, or seawalls, seawalls especially along coastal um, areas, but a lot of times we're trying to save water, we're preventing flooding, so we're going to build a dam or a dike. Um, filling in for solid waste disposal, so sometimes we need more areas to dispose of our solid waste. Um, we're going to talk more about landfills and running out of landfill spaces in a couple of chapters here. Obviously, road building. So we build roads. Uh, think about uh, Alligator Alley here. That's a road that runs through the Everglades. Um, and as we've talked about, it also fragments the habitats there. And also mining. So we've also removed um, or filled in some of these wetlands in order to, to mine for different things. So gravel, fossil fuels, different types of minerals. So, um, coastal wetlands or coastlines, as we've talked about before, very, very important for the organisms that are living in the ocean. So many aquatic organisms, they spend their larval stages along coastlines. And it's kind of like a little safe place where when they're very small, they're not in the big ocean where they're going to be eaten by a predator. Um, definitely down here, they live throughout the, the roots of the mangroves. Um, so they use this area for protection, and, and a lot of these coastlines are considered the nurseries of the organisms um, in the ocean. So they also provide food for a lot of these um, aquatic organisms. And some of the issues that you, again, you probably could have guessed, is that um, as the human population has been growing, we really develop along these coastlines. People spend a lot of money to live on the beach or to live near the ocean. So we're basically taking these natural habitats and we're building on them. And so by doing that, we're really destroying these coastlines and these habitats. And if you look at this picture here, something that we see, here we go a lot of is the building of sea walls. So this is something that's going to come into play, especially with the rising temperatures and global climate change, which is causing the ocean to change as well as thermal stratification, um, or excuse me, uh, thermal expansion. Uh, thermal expansion. So with the, the, the temperatures rising, we're going to see these oceans um, also rise. The sea levels are also going to rise. And so people who are living along coastlines, um, many times they're, they're building sea walls. And so if you look at this picture in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that a sea wall may protect the person's property, um, also removes the beach, but it can actually increase the erosion um, of the beach adjacent to the sea wall. So you can see here in this, this little area that um, because we have the sea wall here, we're increasing the erosion of the beach over here. And so this is, will happen on either side of the sea wall. And obviously we're removing our beaches. And so um, this is also not good for the environment. So we don't want to build sea walls, but it's something that we may see more and more with the, the increase in temperatures and the, the rise in the sea level. And I think that's it. So um, don't forget, you have a quiz on Monday on this chapter. Um, and I'll also post um, the notes. So if you want, you can um, read along with the video. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend.